Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're going to be looking at the Tomb of Black Sand, which is a short dungeon created by the Hot Springs Island crew. Before we get started though, this video is brought to you by the Questing Beast Patreon. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can head down to the link in the description below and sign up to support Questing Beast. Uh, if you do so, you're also going to be able to get previews into my development of Maze Knights, an RPG I am developing that is a sequel to my previous Maze Rats. So let's get in here. This was originally going to be a zine put out on Kickstarter, and then it grew into this fantastically well-produced hardback short dungeon. We have a cloth cover here. We have this fantastic illustration done by a classic TSR artist. I have blanked out on the name. Uh, the cover is done by Daniel Horn. Um, all done, you can tell that it's hand painted. It's beautiful. It evokes that classic pulp feel really, really well. It even has this font that was created for it, the Tomb of Black Sand. Um, if you buy this in PDF, you actually get the font for this as well, which is a really cool idea. Here's our back cover. And let's get into the actual material here. We start off with an inside cover map of the dungeon. A great place to put it. Makes it very easy to reference. Along with a key right here. That's really good. So that even as you start the adventure, you can get a clear sense of what everything is. I like that. Need a hook? So here are some reasons why your players might want to get involved. You can quickly throw them in with one of these excuses. Essentially, people are disappearing. And there could be a number of reasons why that is happening. So this is illustrated by Gabriel Hernandez, the same illustrator who worked on Hot Springs Island. I'll put a link to that right up here if you want to check out my Hot Springs Island review. It's written by Jacob Hurst and Donnie Garcia. Layout by Jacob Hurst, edited by Fiona Geist. Maps by Carl Stiernberg, covered by Daniel Horn. The basic rundown here is that this is the tomb of a lich. However, this lich is, you know, he's a typical lich. He's enormously powerful, way more powerful than you. So if a typical D&D party wanders into this dungeon and then tries to fight or confront the lich, they're just going to get obliterated. But that's not the goal here. The goal is to get in, accomplish a mission, maybe steal some gold, and then get out again. One thing I really love is this uh, advice for a cold start. I, in fact, I kind of like this cold start better than the standard find the dungeon and break your way in. What Jacob recommends here is that, especially if you're running out of convention, you start with the players already kidnapped and inside the tomb, then they have to break out of it. I really love that. It gives players a reason for being there, and it gives them a very concrete goal. We have a short little hex crawl along with a starting uh, location, a little town called Brighton with some NPCs who are there that might hire you to do things or perhaps that you can investigate before you actually set out to try and find this dungeon and delve into it. There is a backstory to this dungeon. Essentially, the Lich um, built it in order to try and create a long-term ritual that would, that would help him ascend to being a demi-lich so that he could leave the mortal plane entirely. However, he fell in love with a woman, and in the process of doing this ritual, he turned her into a banshee, and now she and him live in this dungeon, slowly trying to, to accomplish this ritual, which does involve sacrificing a whole lot of people over time, which is why a lot of the villagers have been vanishing. We also have some other NPCs, uh, for, which are the uh, three brothers of the uh, woman who was turned into a banshee. What's happened is that they have been turned into werewolves, and they're stuck in this kind of loop where every morning they wake up as humans, and then they search for the tomb. They find it, they burst in, and are turned into werewolves for reasons. Uh, there's a lot of moon imagery inside the tomb. They go berserk, and then eventually they're driven out, but they forget everything from the last day and then they repeat again. So they've been continually finding and invading the tomb and then being driven out or fleeing over and over again. An overview of the Tomb of Black Sand with some sights and sounds. We have the actual ritual. Uh, we have, this is also works as a random encounter table. This doesn't explicitly have a random encounter table, but I think this would work pretty well. 
I think I counted up at one point the odds of getting an actual creature, and it's like roughly 30%. So if you rolled on this table every 10 minutes, maybe every 20 minutes, if you wanted to be more traditional, I think that would work pretty well. And any sort of dungeon like this really does need a random encounter table just to keep things moving. We have basically how the ritual works and what the Lich is trying to do here. The general procedure that it goes through that you can, I suppose, try and disrupt. We have sand everywhere. This is the Tomb of Black Sand. So as uh, people are being sacrificed, they're sort of being dissolved into this black sand that now coats the dungeon everywhere. However, it's not really just sand. It's called a, uh, a slurry of necromantic potential, entirely comp comprised of angry, charred, and finely powdered bone fragments. The sand is undead, but neutral. So uh, there are skulls all over the place. If the skulls fall into the sand, they rise as skeletons. The sand can come alive and try and grab you. There's a little um, mini game here for suffocating because you can be grabbed and pulled into one of these little dunes of sand that ring the hallway and you can suffocate if you're not careful. We have the entrance area, which is full of these little crevices where people are being kept for the ritual. One thing that I thought was a little interesting, and I'm not totally sure about this, is a lot of these bodies all have jewelry on them. There's quite a lot of jewelry, in fact. If players do discover this doom, one thing I was concerned about is that they could come in, find all of these bodies in these crevices, simply take all the gold, which I think comes to around like 10,000 gold or so, and then flee. Of course, a lot of players won't do that because they'll want to push further into the tomb, but it does offer a lot of potential gold right at the beginning without a lot of you know problems associated with that, which I think concerns me a little bit. There's also some things that I'm not totally sure about. For example, uh, we have this room down here, um, room three. So this is a, uh, a room choked with black sand. The black sand spills into the hallway, piled almost to the ceiling, smooth walls. The sand noticeably moves from here to number two. So it's sort of trickling out this way, but the room remains filled. 20% chance to see a small geyser of sand erupt from the corner above the secret tunnel. So there's a secret tunnel here down to this room over here. But I feel like maybe I missed something. But reading this, I'm not totally sure how the sand is getting here from this room, since I don't think this room is actually full of sand. And it doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the theme of like what the necromancer is doing with the sand. I ran into a couple questions like that I was reading while I was reading it, where I wasn't sure what was really going on or how I would explain to players what was happening if they asked. We have a door here that you can get through. Um, what's nice is that the layout is very well done where things are broken into these fairly short paragraphs, but important things are bolded. So this allows you to scan the paragraph and quickly grab the important things and give you a sense of what's going on. So you don't have to sort of dig through the entire paragraph before you explain it to players. We have a moon pool in the center where there is a banshee that you can fight or not fight. One interesting thing about this dungeon is that it's not super combat focused. There are skeletons everywhere, but the skeletons have been programmed to just help accomplish this lich's ritual. It's not, they're not really interested in fighting you unless you cause a problem for them. One thing I would have liked to see more detail on is what exactly constitutes causing a problem for the skeletons and for the creatures here. I mean, is it, is it just fighting them? If you try and take a body, does that count? Um, and so on and so forth. I would have liked to see more information on that. We have where the Lich's phylactery is. And of course, there's always a false phylactery, so it's not easy to find it. We have Minerva, the Banshee, who has a lot of uh, great special moves that she can do to make fighting her very interesting. You're not really supposed to fight all the things in this dungeon, right? It's a Lich's lair. So if players should be, you should give players that information. That's what I would do so that they know exactly how dangerous this place is, so that they can use politics and scheming and stealth in order to investigate and reap the, the rewards from this dungeon, rather than thinking they have to fight everything, because they're not going to have a good time if they do that. Most of the stats here are designed for 5th edition D&D. &D. Of course, th these would be very easily adaptable to BX D&D &D as well, or any other OSR system. 
We have the werewolves, great illustration of the werewolves here, that could burst in through the door at any moment and cause further havoc inside the tomb. We have a chapel, along with an altar, some cool plants that all have special magical effects that you can use. It's great to have weird little tools like that. We have a number of uh, locations here, along with the trophy suite. So whenever uh, characters or NPCs are sort of kidnapped or lured to this dungeon and placed into the crevices, they always bring an object with them that kind of keeps them there. And these are all stored here. Also guarding this area is a flesh golem. So if you plan to actually penetrate back to this area, you're probably going to have to break down this door, and the noise is going to activate a flesh golem, this lovely fellow who's going to come here and rip you in half. That's what flesh golems do. We have the actual lich's chambers itself. If you're smart, you're never going to go in here because it's a lich. We have stats for the lich itself, if you are foolish enough to actually want to deal with him. We have rooms for processing the bodies for the ritual. We have furnaces. We have a, ca uh, a chandlery where a skeleton is creating magical candles that have different effects, some of which push back the black sand, which can try and lure you in, and some have other effects as well. One thing, I, uh, another thing that I would have liked a little bit more of, this book does a good job in letting you know where the black sand is. So if there's black sand covering the room or maybe just at the corners of the room, the room description will always tell you. One thing I would have liked is to actually see that on the map so that I could see at a glance where the black sand was and maybe more information about how to actually deal with it. Because it says if players you know, wander directly into the black sand, then there's certain repercussions that can happen. And in rooms that are totally covered in sand, it makes sense how that's supposed to work. But in rooms where that's not entirely the case or it's just patchy or it's just up against the walls, it's not uh, immediately obvious how to rule that and to make that work in a mechanical way. I'd like to see more advice on that. We have the Sand Thresher. Lots of really gigantic, horrible monsters, which is kind of a nice twist, actually, compared to a lot of the dungeons that I've seen before, which are all trying to be very, you know, um, player appropriate or level appropriate. By putting a lot of really high level, horrible things in here that aren't necessarily aggressive, it's really going to give players uh, some interesting choices in terms of how they deal with it. You can swallow it, or you can try and steal its eye, which is a giant, flawless blue topaz. That's motivation right there to try and fight it. We got a treasure room, piled and piled full of gold, along with a cat. Here he is, Domino. He's not just a normal cat, though. He is the guardian of this treasure. He is a white, uh, long-haired cat with a bright blue eyes, and he sits atop a pillar in the center of the room. Um, Domino cannot leave the room and doesn't want to. If forcibly removed, she will, she will reappears on the pillar as soon as she crosses the threshold. She's fine with individuals touching the treasure in the room, but if they attempt to leave with any, she transforms into a large black tiger with white stripes. If anyone escapes with her treasure and returns, she will purr for them. If all the treasure is removed from the room, the pillar will spin rapidly for a moment and become a um, as light as a feather for easy transport to a new horde in need of a guardian. That's really neat because you get to deal with this, you know, little cat who can turn into a giant tiger. But from the description itself, what I was wondering is I couldn't quite figure out how it worked again because she's a cat and she cannot leave the room and doesn't want to. So, and she's in the middle of the room. So you could just sort of like walk into the room, grab huge handfuls of gold or, you know, sacks full of gold, and then just like step back out of the room again. And technically she wouldn't be able to follow you. So that's confused me a little bit as to how that would work. Because that's what my players would probably do. Maybe it would only work one time. And then she would be a giant tiger and sort of threaten anyone who came back in a second time. We have some stats for the different types of monsters you might find in here, including animated armor, black puddings, candle golems. I love that. Elemental wolves. Sand bulls, sand skeletons. So there's a number of different kinds of skulls around this dungeon. And knocking them into the sand will just turn them into skeletal versions of that. We have the Thief's Blade. This one's kind of fun. So it's a sword, essentially. I assume it's maybe a little bit psychic. 
Um, if suddenly revealed, attacks with advantage plus five, does some extra damage. It's a stalker. It tends to float along and stealthily follow targets. If bloodied, the blade will uh, slowly float, hilt first toward an attacker to offer its services. So you can defeat it and recruit it um, to yourself. It's great to have sentient weapons. There's not enough of that, especially in modern D&D. Another map of the dungeon, basically the same as the one on the inside front cover. And we have some legal stuff at the back. Kickstarter backers here. I was also a Kickstarter backer. I'm probably in here somewhere. So there we go. Beautiful production design. This thing looks gorgeous. It's extremely sturdy. One thing I would point out is that due to the way it's constructed, it doesn't really lie that well flat. It really kind of wants to bounce up a little bit. It's not really that big of a deal. Um, I can tell that there is stitched binding in here, which is really great. because That means it's going to be sturdy and last for a long time. Um, but the uh, books like A Pound of Flesh, for example, that are saddle stitched tend to lie a bit flatter which I do prefer, but that's the price you pay for having a hardback book, I suppose. So it's in all in all, it's a really interesting dungeon. It's extremely thematic. It's very flavorful. Um, there's a reason for it being there. All the characters in there have backstories. Um, if you meet them, they have things to talk about. They have reasons for being there. They have goals that they're trying to accomplish. My only criticism would be that I would like more information on how to deal with some of the things there, how the uh, denizens are going to react to you, and I just had a couple questions about um, how some of the mechanics work. But apart from that, it is really cool. I would actually really like to run this just so that the players can um, get a sense of those really interesting NPCs and the weird sights and the creepy sounds that are following you throughout this dungeon. For example, as you're wandering along, you can see like skeletal hands like reach out of the black sand and try and grab at your ankles as you pass by. Lots of great little touches like that that are just wonderfully creepy and really set the mood. So that's it for Tomb of Black Sand. I will put links in the description below for where you can pick this up for yourself. And uh, thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you guys next time.